So Don, welcome to the Mr. Beacon podcast. I'm really excited to have you on the show. Thank you, Steve. I, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I love what you're doing here and, and definitely I've added you to my my list of podcasts. So I'm very, very excited to be here. Terrific. Well, um, what you're doing, uh, what you've written about, you've written a book, which is what we're going to talk about. Um, as a Ghana group analyst, there's a ton of things that we could end up getting uh, sidetracked on to, and, and maybe we will. But we're here to talk about your book, uh, When Machines Become Customers, Ready or Not. Uh, and so I, I guess we should start off by um, setting the scene and just explaining what, what is a machine customer. So Steve, a machine customer, our definition of it is a non-human economic actor that can obtain goods or services in exchange for payment. So essentially buying and selling. And uh, we are very, are very deliberate about that in the book. We are not talking about Skynet. We're not talking about chat GPT. We're not talking about the singularity. We're simply talking about commerce, which is why machine when machines become customers is mostly a business book first and a technology book second. And what was it that inspired you to write it? So the, the story is about seven years ago, our chief of research uh, at Gartner, Chris Howard, uh, was putting together uh, kind of our version of TED Talks for Gartner has a big conference in Orlando every year. So it's our version of TED Talks. And he asked me, he just gave me a title. He said, what happens when things become customers? And seven years ago, that was at the height of our Invent of Things research, which I, I know you're familiar with. So I said, okay, that's, yeah, I could do that. You know, I'm, I'm a marketer. I can come up with the ideas, that whole general journalist training kind of kicked in. And basically I presented, uh, did a, a, a TED like talk to about 800 people, um, at, back in 2014, I think 2015, can't remember. And that launched a whole line of, of research. Um, uh, we probably have 15 different research notes, presentations, web, uh, webinars, uh, and. What's been gratifying is the concept has evolved over time, and I've been able to involve about two dozen of my colleagues to co-author with me on different things. And now some of my colleagues are taking it a step further on their own. So it started with, really with a simple question and then evolved into all this content until finally I was sitting with Mark Reschino in South Africa at one of our conferences and say, Mark, I think I've got enough for a book. And he said, I think you do. Would you mind if I worked with you on it? And I said, of course. And that got, that got us started. That's a fascinating um, catalyst that, that you just described. Is there something, so it sounded like it, it wasn't like you, you kind of stumbled on this uh, idea and it, it came from a client. It was kind of a, a thought experiment that then took on a life of its own yeah. and, and, and it sounds like that flowered in the presentation, uh, you're presenting to 800 people. That's, that's a pretty good test of whether the idea is, uh, coherent, but I'm assuming there are implications, things, use cases that kind of fired you with enthusiasm where, you know, William, I, I actually read your book or I'm reading your book and I keep on thinking about our situation and ambient IoT uh -huh. and how how do you get people to really think this through and take the idea se seriously? So, was there a um, you know was there a use case or an application or an event yeah. that really fired you with the need to tell this story? Yeah, yeah, great question, Steve. So when we were when I was doing that first presentation is when I came across HP's Instant Ink service, which we we feature pretty prominently in the book. And basically that led us to the fact that HP in effect was manufacturing its own customers. And that very concept of, hey, I can make my own customers. I don't have to try to try to get them and uh, through traditional means really kind of crystallize it for me. That makes total sense. Yeah. So, and then that led us to other things like the dog, uh, uh, like another example I put in that first presentation was a smart dog tag um, that was able to 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 track the movements of a dog. And once you start to see all these IoT devices, you say, okay, maybe they do one thing and all they do is announce information. But we ask the question, as we often do at Gartner, what if you take it a step further? What if that, um, and again, this is seven years ago, what if that sensor on the dog could say, okay, 
based on the dog's movements and their eating schedule, it looks like he's sick and you need to, you may need to examine him or maybe even take him to the vet. And oh, by the way, could sh I can schedule an appointment for you. It's, you take the ideas and that one kernel and you start to expand it. And when we share those scenarios with our clients, they kind of sit up and say, oh, I hadn't thought about that. So I, I think one of the most interesting things in those early years of our doing the research is um, I was able to fill rooms. I was able to get people to read the stuff, but invariably was I never thought about it that way. And that, that kept us going. I, I have to say throughout reading um, your, your book, I was, I was, it was like running from one side of the boat to the other side of the boat. Part of me was like, yes, this is it. It's going to be a profound change. And then I'm like, well, is this really a thing? Is, I mean, uh, because you're latching on to things that exist at the, uh, at the moment. And, but the big question is, is this going to go way beyond Amazon dash buttons and that sort of thing? Yeah. What was it that convinced you that this was going to be more than it is at the moment because you described three stages and we should yeah. we should get into talking about yeah. what the three stages but what was it that really convinced you that this would be a truly disruptive phenomenon rather than kind of a, a, a clever marketing gimmick by a inkjet printer company sure so when we actually uh, gertner has a, a pr our line of research that we call maverick which is basically where we challenge our own positions essentially it's kind of a counter culture uh, yeah. line of research so we actually did one on um things as customers and part of that research was we actually examined what you and i do as human customers so obviously we buy things we receive messages uh like emails and advertising we actually request service when something's wrong we actually negotiate and we all love to negotiate and then we um we basically tell other people about our experiences so we, we do all five of those things and then as we looked at the at the time the variety of iot devices we said okay we, we actually were able to isolate a device or a smart system that was doing one of those activities and then that led us down the path to find more case examples and now I have to say we have we have almost a hundred different examples of a device or a smart system because a machine customer isn't always physical. It could be a virtual machine like an Alexa or you know Siri or some of the other virtual assistants. And again, that again that led us to keep going and say, okay, there's something here. Uh, so that that was part of the discovery of it. And when we would talk to people. They would tell us more examples. They'd say, oh, I saw this and I saw that. So it was, it was kind of a discovery, a treasure hunt for us. Well, one of the things I love about my day job is that I'm constantly coming across new use cases. And it's normally uh -huh. because of customers or potential customers. And one of my favorite is a car battery that could reorder itself. There's yes. nothing worse than having a car battery that, that gives up the ghost. And then you've got to, yeah. you know, it's not a fun show. Some shopping is fun. Shopping for car batteries is not fun. So I, oh, I, yeah. I welcome the opportunity for that to, to, to come about. Yeah, we, we talk a lot about drudgery in the book. You know, the things that we have to do, not just at home, but also at work. You know, those reordering of supplies or mowing the lawn or buying laundry detergent, uh, remembering to order pods for your, for your coffee maker. These are all things we're not really good at it. We forget. Uh, we order too much or too little. And what we the case we try to make is a machine customer doesn't forget. It works 24 seven. It does what you ask it to do and it's reliable. And that is, again, when we, when we tell that story, it's, we're, we're still really much in an education process, Steve. We're trying to get people to realize that these devices can actually do more for us if we let them. And, uh, that that where you know when we when we share that with a skeptical audience we definitely the light bulbs go up said yeah I, I could see that um it's it's really interesting watching people's reactions to this so i want to come back to advantages for the customer uh, i yeah. guess the customer can be a consumer it can also be a business right uh, and i can imagine a lot of benefits for the seller but perhaps you should enumerate those if i'm uh uh, in the business of selling products, why would I um, make this a strategic initiative in my company getting ready for this uh, uh -huh. uh, this this change in the way people buy and sell? So 
the, the reason, so marketing at the biggest impact with machine customers is going to be on the marketing and sales functions, because most of those, those functions, and I'm a marketer, so I can say this, and I've worked with salespeople is that a lot of that process is emotion based. Uh, we basically prey on your weaknesses. Uh, we talk about fear of missing out. Uh, we appeal to your aspirations and your dreams when we sell products, uh, both at work and at home. And the biggest difference, obviously, is that these machines don't have emotion. They are based on rules and logic. So if you think about the process, we often like to talk about, let's say, for example, you delegate your grocery shopping to the house, and maybe maybe Alexa is your assistant or maybe something else. And let's say that you're a manufacturer of um, cinnamon rolls, and you desperately want to get that into the shopping cart, but the people in the house say, you know, we're on a diet right now, so there's no way you can put that in the cart. So as a maker of cinnamon rolls, I have to figure out a way to bust through the algorithm so that I can land in that shopping cart. And that is, that's the, that's the challenge that's going to be out there. We often talk to our, uh, I've been working with our sales practice that maybe the salesperson of the future is a data scientist and not a salesperson and people's heads explode when they hear that. Um, Marketers, yeah. marketers don't like it because what do you mean? I can't, and I can say this. What do you mean? I can't use Beyonce to sell products because the machine customer doesn't care who your spokesperson is. They don't care about your slick advertising. They want to know is, do you have the information that I need? Cause I have this long list of requirements and I have this much time to do it. If you don't give me that, I'm going to switch to the next person, the next company that does it. So the whole marketing and sales process is going to be much more programmatic, algorithm driven. And that is what, that's the biggest change that we see coming. And, and really, in a sense, it's an evolution of what's happening already uh, in the, uh, you know, I, I'm really a CMO. That's my day job. And we spend an awful lot of time on search engine optimization. Uh, we're now thinking about um, chatbot optimization. Uh, you know, like all of us, we, you, I think you end up, uh, 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 chat GPTing yourself, your company. And I, I've just been amazed at the amount of content that is out there. We're not a Fortune 500 company, but yeah. uh, um, Chat GPT is really smart. And it's fascinating seeing the, the, the fingerprints of where that data might have come from. And yes. so I think what you're describing is just, you know, it's, it's a progression of that. Is that fair? Uh, oh, yes. Well, yeah, without question. I mean, um, the, if you think about it, if a machine customer is programmed with rules, uh, and instructions, and their job is uh, tirelessly to find that information, the organization that, that is able to make the information easy to find, easy to consume, and your e your e-commerce portal is easy to purchase from, those are the people that are going to win out. Um, so one of the pieces of advice we give to clients is you have to be exceptional, not good but exceptional at digital commerce because where are machines going to go to first? They're not going to call your service center to get products. So they're going to go right to your digital commerce platform. So those are some of the capabilities that people need to be thinking about anyway, but even it'll be even more so when a million machine customers are knocking on your door wanting something. So Don, what happens to retail therapy? That was one of the things <laughs> that kept on like yeah. bothering me as I was reading this. Yeah. Because for some people, actually not so much for me, although sometimes it depends on the product category, uh, you know, for some people, they love shopping. And uh, aren't you yeah. kind of cheating them out of uh, one of their favorite hobbies uh, with this no, concept? No, no, not at all, Steve. No, no. Actually, what we're saying is, is that um, if you delegate some of the shopping that brings you joy to a machine, yes, you're going to lose some of that joy. Um but this isn't going to be true for every product category. So for example, my wife who loves purses, she would never delegate the shopping and purchasing of a purse to a machine because it's very emotional for her. Uh, same thing with buying a car uh, for anybody. That's an emotional purchase. Uh, but what I see happening is that maybe the machine does all the research for you and you still make the decision. So one of the interesting things that I've been doing at the book signings that we've been having is I asked people as they come up to get a book, I said, what do you want a machine customer to do for you? And grocery shopping, um, plan a vacation for me, uh, maybe get started on a new hobby, 
uh, buy my clothes for me because these are all very complex and tons of choices. And so to me, that, that aspect of shopping where you have a lot of choices, there's definitely purchase regret. You know, we buy something and then we immediately feel bad about it. I think a machine customer can help us with that. But, uh, but primarily this is focused on the repeatable drudgery oriented tasks that you could just, I would love, I would love to, to get rid of some things like filing toilet paper. How, how do you see chat GPT in this? Is it, is it a step in the direction of a machine customer? Without question, Steve, and I'll be honest with you, uh, Mark and I pushed the button to publish the book on January 4th, I think, or 5th, and then ChatGPT literally exploded a week or two after that. So uh, so we actually, and, but the good thing is, we actually are planning an update to the book this fall, and because we're publishing it on Amazon, we can actually update the book and it, because it's print on demand, we don't have to have another print run, special print run. So the answer is yes, it has very big implications because if you think about what generative AI does is it actually helps um, the communication process between a human and a machine or a system. Uh, and that's one of the big benefits of it. So my ability, so for example, right now, if I work with my Alexa, the functionality is good, but it's very limited. And we all know that. And it's also been, I mean, it's a bit, it's amazing technology, but imagine if Alexa was infused with generative AI with the type of conversations you could have with it, how you could give it instructions and, and what it could find out for you. So we are actually going to update the book with the implications of generative AI. We talked about AI, of course, as an enabling technology, but we didn't get into depth on, on things like chat GPT. Yeah, I, I was using it. I, I need, I don't need, I want to get a Bluetooth, um, um, uh, a Bluetooth receiver for my, I've got a very kind of geeky, uh, hi-fi system with valves and that sort of thing. And so, uh, and I, I actually found it really helpful in the research. I, I yeah. asked for a short list. I asked it to compare the different components and I even kind of reset the basis of decision for selecting the i mean it was it was a great experience and i actually yeah. really enjoyed it it helped me less time googling and filtering through a bunch of extraneous stuff and having it's like having a conversation with a smart person rather mm -hmm. than a not smart person yeah well i what you what you just said is that this technology is helping you become more confident in your purchase decision yeah and yeah. we all want that. We all want to feel good about our decisions. And sometimes we don't. So while we say, you know, um, conceptually uh, about what a machine customer can do for you, it was chat GPT that actually say, here's the manifestation of that, yeah, that extra work that you don't have time to do. So, so we're moving forward in the evolution of this concept and you talk about three stages uh, in that evolution. Can you, yeah. can you outline those? Yeah, so the, the first stage is what we call machines as bound customers. And basically, I'm the human, I'm in charge. I tell the machine what to do, the machine executes it. So if you think about the HP example, that's an example of a bound customer because the printer can only buy HP ink. So I can't ask my printer to go off into the marketplace and buy any type of ink. It has to be HP. So that's where we see things happening. It's the, it's the classic walled garden. I'm going to control everything. And I'm going to keep other people out. And that's fine. That That's a good step. But we think that the bigger opportunity is the next stage, what we call machines as adaptable customers, where the machine actually can choose from a variety of sources. One of the best examples of that are some financial service planning firms like Wealthfront or Betterment, who use tech, AI technology to go into the marketplace and select the best investments for you based on your objectives. So they're not just bound to the funds that are owned and managed by themselves, but to entire into the entire marketplace. Think about it a little bit like a reverse auction. Um, that is the, the stage that we're in right now. And we're going to be in that for a few years because so many customers, people that we talk to, they want to control everything. They don't want to allow access. They don't want to share information. And that's going to inhibit the development of this. Uh, in fact, one of uh, our clients Actually, we interviewed them. Um, this is a company out of Italy called iProd. And they basically, they're saying they created the first machine customer commerce platform where they will actually connect 
uh, uh, machines that are actually requesting items and machines that can fulfill items. And we expect to see more and more of those, those platforms. But without people sharing information, without open platforms, this thing will not progress that far. We don't see that happening. We see it being a gradual, you know, evolution, uh, gradual development of that, that, that part of it. Uh, the third and final stage is what we would call machines as autonomous customers. And what that means is that the machine will actually do things proactively for you based on inferring your behaviors. So the example that we like to use is that Mark and I are getting older and maybe um, our machine customer says, well, maybe you might feel better with three ply toilet paper, maybe even those wet wipes versus traditional toilet paper. And, I'm, and while at first you, your first reaction is, well, I'm not getting older. The answer is you are. But it's an example of how the machine is basically proactively suggesting stuff by observing you uh, in detail. But also that the machine has its own needs. And one of the things that we had fun with is we created, uh, we modeled the um, after Asimov's three laws of robotics to create four different laws or rules for machine customers. But the machine customer in that third scenario, let's say for example, and, and Elon Musk has already talked about this, is what if your Tesla could hire itself out when you're not using it and earn you money or maybe earn money for its own repairs. So again, it sounds kind of creepy, but not outside the realm of possibility. So those are the three phases that we talk about. Fascinating. You reference platforms and uh, I do want to talk about, uh, there's a bunch of other things that I'm desperate to get onto, but I can't uh, miss out on the platform discussion. So we see um, platforms like Amazon um, is this a threat to Amazon or I'm assuming it's a huge opportunity as well? No, I mean, we're pretty clear, Steve, that, that the digital giants are going to bring this to life. Um, they have the, they have the computing power, they have the engineering talent, they have the forethought. So the Googles, the Amazons, uh, are, are going to be the ones that are going to bring this to life. Um, it, we will see niche players, maybe industry specific platforms. But the, the general will, will likely be driven by these. And I think the, the appearance of chat GPT and generative AI, we're already starting to see that show up. So Microsoft just announced that they're going to integrate that into their Microsoft Office 365 suite. Um, what's to prevent Amazon from launching their own generative AI to improve the shopping and the purchasing experience of its customers? So I, I think that those are going to um, bring them to life. But the other thing that we didn't talk about in the book, but I'm actually working on a separate project, is the fact that these bots are still owned by somebody else. You don't own your bot. And that's important because the bot is not actually working for you. It's actually working for the person that owns the company that owns it. So we are, uh, we call, again, this is a Maverick project that I'm working on. What if we could own our own bots? And what does that mean? Uh, and that has also very different implications um, above and beyond what we actually wrote in the book. So again, the idea is, is like we call, we call it like in a virus. It's actually spreading and it's actually mutating and, and, and things like this. These conversations are actually bringing up new, new stuff. So it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of cool how it's evolving, even though we just published a book. Inevitably, you start to think about risks, what could possibly go wrong. And yeah. you know, the fact that you don't own the bot you know, immediately sets off alarm signals in oh, my yeah. mind. And you can imagine um, in the same way as you hope that your procurement department doesn't get subverted by too many lunches from uh, yeah. some uh, seller, you know, w w what are the risks there that we need to worry about generally and specifically with regard to um, the, the fact that these platforms are potential, or the, the, uh, the machines that are uh, yeah. are uh, buying on our behalf, potentially and by other people. So the thing that we are very clear about is that humans have the off switch. We have to, but it's also humans that create the algorithms that lead to the purchasing activity or the activity in general. So uh, we have actually half of a chapter devoted to this. Bad actors will program bad machine customers. It's just going to happen. Just like every other type of technology that has been subverted by bad actors, the same thing will happen with machine customers. So one example, we came across a couple of that, that have been in the press the last couple of years, the one of um, a, uh, uh, a company that manufactures um, uh, 
those cameras for uh, in in the children's rooms, baby mm-hmm. cams, I think they're called. Mm-hmm. Those have been hacked uh, by bad actors. Uh, there was a company that made a internet enabled garage door opener, and somebody wrote a bad review of it. So basically, that company, somebody in that company, bricked the garage door opener so the person could not open their garage door. Uh, and that, that's just mild, but think about bot attacks and planned sabotage and espionage. You know, those are, uh, we talk about that in the book, that there are, there's potential for sabotage and damage, but I think most of it are going to be unintended consequences. Uh, things that people didn't plan to happen, but they happen. So we've been hearing a lot of examples of the responses from chat GPT that are kind of surprising to us maybe raise the hairs on the back of our neck. Those are unplanned, right? Unintentional, Mm -hmm. but they're a function of the technology. So those, those are, those are some of the things that we lay out. The way to combat that, I think, is we apply the same security protocols that you do right now, um, extend that to machine customers. But also we talk a lot about the ethics of machine customers and how that needs to be built in up front and instead of kind of tacking it on at the end. So uh, Gartner's done a lot of work on digital ethics. The the same ethical rules apply to its use of our use of machine customers. Uh, well, yeah, one of the things where I think a machine customer would be really useful is in healthcare. I mean, you talk about a complex buying problem, and you know how do, how do I buy this medical procedure and my treatment and medicine and all of these things? That could be a a huge boom. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, as somebody who, you know, whose spouse had to go through some significant medical treatment recently, uh, talk about feeling like you you don't know anything and being afraid at the same time, you know, it's what if we miss something? Is there a treatment out there that we miss that could have been helpful? Uh, I think the healthcare system is so complex and it feels like it's getting even more complex. Um, and I think something like this, who could do the research for you and, and maybe give you recommendations, which would be great. But we also know that the healthcare regulations in this country are so stringent that probably won't happen uh, uh-huh. anytime soon. But the potentials there, Steve, you know, uh, you know, maybe somebody that you love has a rare form of cancer. Can you scan all the medical evidence and give me a summary of that? Yeah, you know, it would take you hours to do that if and if you could even understand it. But yeah. imagine that this, you know, generative AI could summarize a you in plain English, which which is what they do. That is huge. So yeah, I, I wish for that. So uh, what about IoT? Uh, this podcast yeah. is uh, is about IoT, and we haven't really yeah. talked about it. I think it's kind of been this. Uh, those of us who are kind of in the ecosystem have probably been yeah. like doing a uh, subconscious or background match to all the IoT issues, but. How is IoT relevant to the world of uh, machine customers? I, see, it's really how the concept started. You asked me how it started. Um, the right answer was IoT, which, uh-huh. you know, the HP printer is a thing. It's connected to the internet. It's an IoT device. Most people don't think about, about it that way, but IoT is really at the heart of machine customers. Now, we also have evolved that to include virtual machines, the, the assistants, where you have to. But IoT is central because, you know, like it or don't like it, we're surrounded by physical objects. And the fact that any physical op- object can be instrumented means that it actually has the potential to be a customer. So, um, you know, there's no shortage of use cases of IoT. But the thing that we we look at is that why aren't you taking this a step further? Uh, why aren't you getting into proactively recommending purchases, not just what needs to be done? Uh, it, that to me is where the opportunities are and to be able to think through them. That's, that's one of the big pieces of advice is you have to start creating scenarios, take a, a person out, put an IOT device in that's connected to a system and becomes a customer. What does that look like for your processes? So I, I think I see it as central. And, and I, um, as, as you know, we focus on ambient IOT, which is the you know going from the internet of expensive things the refrigerators the washing machines to the things that are inside them the the the, the food the clothing yeah. the the medicine and you know we already have evidence uh, we have projects where people are 
putting containers for herbs and spices online and then you can imagine you know you have yeah and clothing when clothing goes online uh you know your wardrobe could be managed uh you know a wardrobe assistant seems to me oh, could definitely. be a machine customer how many people's wardrobes are filled with clothing that oh. they haven't worn for years and that could be in the hands of someone who could really use it and maybe you get some value back and then what do you replace it with? And, you know, I struggle with clothing. I, I, I like to wear nice clothes, but I'm just hopeless at buying it. I don't like doing it. I would love for a machine customer to uh, make me look good, basically. Well, you know, that actually exists today, Steve. It's called Stitch Fix. Um, in the UK, it's called Threads. And basically, you know, uh, while we didn't profile them in, in the book, we do talk about them. Because essentially what they do is that they learn about you through questions, but they also learn about you when they, they'll give you two items or they give you an item to pick and say, would you wear this? And you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So you will, you will actually train that algorithm to know what you like and what you don't like. It compares your responses to people like you. And what ends up happening is that as many times as you want, they will actually curate a set of clothing and accessories just for you based on the sizes and the, your preferences. But the thing that we like to talk about is that a human stylist is always checking that before it actually gets to you. And that's the thing that, you know, you call it human in the loop or, or whatever, whatever the term is. We also consider that in, in this world of machine customers is that there will be a human involved in some part of the process. But yeah, I mean, I, I love to, we actually talked to a clothing manufacturer uh, about this topic. And what that person was talking about is the closet being the, basically that sensor device that looks at things and says, okay, this is out of season. You never wear this thing because you've never pulled it out. Um, why don't you donate that? Or, hey, we'll send it to this circular clothing place that now ex that they exist and let somebody else take it off your hands. I mean that the, the possibilities are endless. That's that's the co the cool part about this stuff. Yeah, there's a group called the Sustainability Consortium that's been looking at measuring um, that cycle of wearing and washing, and um, uh, you know that has uh, at the moment Amazon's amazing, but it doesn't know if I have bought this size of clothing and I wore it once or I wear it every yeah. week. And uh, I think the opportunity to Machine customers could really help with the circular economy uh, by yeah. uh, um, uh, by by kind of exchanging value and understanding, getting some insight into uh, how to curate that uh, that wardrobe. Very good. Well, we've covered a lot. Uh, anything? What did I miss? What did I miss? There's lots. I guess people need to buy the book to really the book. answer that yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, I, I would I would say that this book is about challenging what the notion of a customer is that you, uh, that we are moving to a world where your best customers may not be human. So what we are asking people to do is just consider the fact, uh, create scenarios, uh, think about the implications for your business, that if you are selling to a machine or machine selling to you, how will you adapt? Uh, because we believe that this, this trend and it's, it's, it's actually happening today will be as big as the e-commerce trend, maybe even bigger. And we all know what's happened to companies that, that jumped on early and companies that jumped on late. And that's why th that's the reason we wrote the book is we wanted people to jump on early and if nothing else, to at least start talking about it. So if people have a conversation uh, within their executive suite about this concept after reading the book, then we will have done our job. I mean, may maybe just to expand on that a little bit more. So I'm the CEO of uh, Ralph Lauren. Um, I, I, hear the conversation that we just had and uh, I'm convinced, but I'm worried, you know, technology is all about timing. In my opinion, just like that's the difference between success yeah. and failure. It's uh, you, you want to move fast enough, um, but not too fast. Whether you're, you're a vendor or a, a consumer, yeah. how do you get the timing? So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, how do you get the timing right? And then the second one is, you know, what what are the handful of things that I as CEO of a company should do to get ready for this? So timing is always tricky, Steve. I think um, a lot of predictions 
that we make at Gartner, we actually get the predictions right, but we often get the timing and we're often early. So we basically did a little bit of research on this a couple of years ago and we asked CEOs, when do you think revenue from machine customers will become material to your business? And w when we say material between 15 and 20% of revenue, they told us 2030. Uh, so that is the horizon that we work with right now is it becoming, again, not everything, but enough to be meaningful by the year 2030. Is that going to be right? You know, one of the people we interviewed for the book was um, Peter Schwartz, who's a futurist at Salesforce. And he was a technical advisor for the movie Minority Report back in 1999. And think about the things that they projected in 1999. But that movie, I believe, was set I think it was 2100 or 2060. I can't remember exactly what the time frame that they were projecting. And a lot of that stuff happened way earlier than they thought. So you can either be super early or super late, but we think 2030, you know, is, is a good time horizon. It's great that you're putting a stake in the ground and, you know, who knows, uh, but, but it's great to have a, a kind of a, a basis for your, uh, your strategic thinking. The one thing I'd point out is if we look at e-commerce, um, I mean, I cut my teeth in retail more on the vendor side when I helped start Qualcomm Retail. And so we were kind of doing a lot of prognosticating about e-commerce in the early days before it really took off. And people would say, yeah, but it's just such a tiny fraction of spending. Uh, but the thing was, um, at some point, you knew where it was going, and even though it was a tiny fraction, the actual impact on the stock price of the companies, whether they're actually moving in the right direction, I would argue will probably be before 2030. If 2030 is the day when we get to 20%, then you know you, you can probably discount that and go back to uh, yeah. uh, just a, a few years when people see evidence that this is happening, and then... Yeah. Uh, you know, there'll be some early actors who will get a huge bump in their stock price and other people who are just in denial mode and they'll yeah. probably be, be punished. I mean, I, again, the thing that we didn't anticipate was, was generative AI exploding. You know, that may, that may accelerate the 2030. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but regardless of what the date is, whether it's 2030 or 2027 or 2040, we do encourage organizations to really take stock of their their marketing and sales processes and in and, and customer service and say, what would happen if machines took over for people? Is your digital commerce site up to snuff? Do you offer all the information about the products that you sell in great detail? Is it available? Is it current? Is your ability to transact with machines um, up to snuff. I mean, those are some very basic things that you can actually do today to start to get ready for it. Um, and it's not going to affect all industries at the same time, Steve. It, we, we would never be so arrogant to say that. But when we ask customers our, our, our survey about where they see it showing up first, one is automobiles, so the self-driving vehicle, and the second is in software. But we asked that, you know, two or three years ago, and now you know, with Microsoft's announcement about chat GPT being integrated in Office 365, we're actually seeing it well before we project it. So the the point here is that there are things you can do today. We actually go into detail in them in the book. So Don, I, I, I was stalking you online and you have an amazing career. You've done a lot of things. Um, so, you know, one of our standard questions on the podcast is how do you get this job? It's a probably a long answer, but I'd love to, to hear you, you know, you worked at Pepsi, uh, you work, did you work at Coke as well? Coca-Cola, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola. Yeah. Right. So tell, tell us a bit about your career and how you ended up being a Gartner Group analyst. So I, uh, I started out my career in marketing at the Quaker Oats company in Chicago and, uh, started off as a, an assistant media analyst. It's ironic that my first title, uh, is actually not uh, the analyst title is in my current job, but um, I, I actually really enjoyed the, the the discipline of marketing. When I was in business school, I had to pick, and marketing to me felt the most creative, but it also has a very strong analytic bent, which I also like. So to me, it was that balance of the two that kind of kept me in the marketing profession. So at Quaker, you know, I got a job right out of school. I was actually an intern there for several months, actually a couple of years, and then. Uh, 
made my way into brand management. So worked on brands like O's Cereal and Gatorade and Kibbles and Bits Dog Food, uh, which was a ton of fun. My big project uh, was actually launching the, the 32 ounce plastic bottle for Gatorade because believe it or not, back in the uh, the early 90s, I'm sorry, the 80s actually, Gatorade was in glass bottles and it would it was not allowed on playing fields because it could shatter. So introducing a plastic bottle was actually kind of a big deal. Also, I added a chicken piece to the Kibbles and Bits dog food brand. So that was kind of fun. A lot harder than it sounds. So was it yeah. like a big deal when they moved to plastic? Were people arguing against it? It'll never catch on? Uh, no, you know, we we didn't have those environmental questions, sadly, because they are really front of mind today. It was The biggest thing we had to deal with, Steve, is a lot of the uh, Gatorade was kept in ice tubs in convenience stores. And our biggest issue was labels falling off because they were getting soaked. So huh. we actually had to create a special type of plastic label, plastic paper hybrid label to make sure it stayed on in the ice tub. So I have to say that the issues back then, this is in, you know, like the, the late 80s, were very different than they are today. Um, but it's still, it's still very interesting. It was a, a wonderful business to work on. And uh, we got to meet Michael Jordan because we had signed him as a spokesperson. And that was a lot of fun. And, and uh, the other thing too is that Quaker... Uh, had a um, did a lot of sponsorships with sports teams because of Gatorade. So, you know, Friday afternoons when nobody was using the box at Wrigley Field, we had a chance to go. A bunch of us, you know, single people, looping it up in a, in the box in Wrigley Field. It was it didn't get any better than that. So it was That's a lot awesome. of fun. Yeah, and what a great foundation. I mean, for you as an analyst, uh, uh, you worked yeah. at one of the best uh, um, CPG companies it, in the world. It really, it really was, Steve, and you know, it was sad that it kind of got absorbed into PepsiCo. But uh, many of us who worked in that business, we still call on that training thirty years later. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing the training that we got, uh, and it, I think the 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 thing that kind of uh, helps me today is we were trained to be generalists. We were trained to be dropped into any situation and figure it out and try to solve it. Uh, and those skills I, I use, so I've used, so used them in every point in my career. So after leaving Chicago, I had the opportunity to um, work in a field office. So working with salespeople. And I, I'd say about half my career was spent uh, working for and with salespeople in addition to being a marketer. So uh, moved from Chicago uh, to Southern California, which is where I live now, um, and didn't know anybody. But I trusted the gentleman that hired me, and I still work with him today at Gartner, and uh, got to learn that side of the business. From there, uh, I got recruited by the Coca-Cola company, so my wife and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. I worked on um, the restaurant business, so what we call Coca-Cola Fountain, which is how Coke started. And I, I was here for a good seven, had a good seven-year run there. But ironically, um, and I, I love telling the story is that my wife still worked for Quaker. That's where she and I met. So she transferred from with Quaker from California to Atlanta, Georgia, and I was working for Coke. And then there was a time where Coca-Cola was going to buy the Quaker Oats company to get the Gatorade business. And then that deal was squashed by the board, and then PepsiCo swoops in to buy it. So then what I had to do is I had to disclose to the company that my wife now works for PepsiCo. And what do you think happened? Uh, they asked you to leave. <laughs> I got fired. I got oh fired God. because it was a technical violation of the company's code of business conduct, even though we actually built the case and my wife got permission from Pepsi for me to work at Coke. So it was kind of a mess. So actually oh. I was, uh, my first day of unemployment was nine 11. Oh my so, goodness. Yeah. Oh my so goodness. leaving a company like Coke, uh, trying to, you know, my second, I just, I'll never forget that day. Many of us don't forget where they were that day. Um, I, I remember, it, yeah. It made the job, and then there was a recession right after that. So trying to find a job in that environment was tough, but I did. Uh, my wife and I pointed our arrow towards Chicago, where uh, Quaker was headquartered again. So she got transferred up there. I got a job with an agency working on Burger King. Um, and then for, from there, I, I decided I wasn't really much of an agency person. I just did. I did it to get to Chicago, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I got, I did something different. I worked for a retailer. I worked for the True Value Company uh, doing field marketing. So hardware yeah. store, right? Hardware stores, yeah. So yeah. very different business model than, you know, beverages and dog food and Gatorade and cereal. So you got, really got to work with a lot of really interesting people and understand the retail business. Um, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, from I there, love hardware stores. That must have been yeah. so fun. <laughs> well, you know, you know what's interesting? Um, the hardware store is a very inch, a very old retail format in the United States, uh, one of the oldest. And it actually, what's interesting about hardware stores is that they know about the houses that surround them. They know who built them. They knew all the components. So you go into the hardware store, bring something from your house. Oh yeah, we know what that is. Let me give you a replacement. It's that type of knowledge that you cannot replicate even at a Home Depot or a Lowe's. They try, but they just, they really don't do it. Uh, yeah. That's the type of service. And then, and then also, if you're looking for a present for your wife or a significant other, the women, the, um, the houseware section in hardware stores are among the best in any type of retail format because you know, who goes shopping with their, their spouses is usually, you know, the women, not always, but, but often. And, mm-hmm. uh, so that's another secret there. Um, Amazing. that was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, from there I got, uh, recruited by Granger, WW Granger, again, a very different format. So that's a B2B, uh, distributor. So I went from B2C marketing, CPG to retail and then to B2B marketing. And uh, there I did um, segment strategy, I did new product development, I had responsibility for the data and analytics uh, time for, for a moment. And what do they distribute? So I'm sorry, Granger is uh, the, one of the largest B2B distributors of facility maintenance supplies. So think about all the stuff that goes into running a building, yeah. uh, the motors, safety supplies, tools cleaning supplies, you know, anything you could think of, they sell it. They're a little bit like at the time, you know, kind of an Amazon for business. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, they were actually one of the first pioneers of e-commerce, uh, right around the same time that Amazon was taking off, uh, which most people don't realize. So Granger's been a a big, and that was a, that was a good experience because I'd never worked in the B2B business before. But like I said earlier, that, um, that training that I got at Quaker still, uh, held true. And one of the things I'm most proud of is I helped launch the first ever TV advertising campaign for Granger, working with an agency, again, using the skills that I had picked up working for CPG companies and at an agency, which was kind of fun. How did, how did that work out? Uh, television advertising is, it just seemed, as I'm a marketing guy, that's my day yeah. job, and it just seems scary, like lots of money. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting because if you look at the the hierarchy of marketing. So CPG is the top, you know, the Cokes, the P&Gs, uh, the Nestle's, right? That's the pinnacle of marketing. B2B is somewhere in the middle and B2B services is actually near the bottom. But I think what was interesting is that we made a pretty good business case that, uh, you know, we were doing exceptionally well as an organization, as a business without TV advertising. Uh, we didn't know how much we could do with it. And, and at the time, we actually signed Mike Rowe, who was uh, kind of doing his dirty job thing as our spokesperson. So we built uh, built a lot of advertising and, and marketing around him as well. That was the first time we'd ever have a, had a spokesperson. So I think what it did for the brand is it added a different dimension to people's perceptions. Because most, if, if you, you know, if you're a, a maintenance person, you know who Granger is, but most people don't. So it was an opportunity to kind of broaden people's understanding of what we did. But I, I mean, it, to me, the, what your buyers are not like, uh, most people are not your buyers, right? Uh, so I'm watching Alias Smith and Jones or Kojak or whatever yeah. was playing. And I don't know what, what yeah. this was exactly. I don't need to go yeah. back. But uh, how do you justify like educating all these people who are not customers with a television so, advertising campaign? Well, I mean, that was uh, TV advertising is often an awareness building. We had plenty of other activities from a marketing standpoint. We would have uh, a very robust sales organization. They were armed with a lot of, you know, ways that we could add value. One of the biggest things that we did for customers is basically teach them how to manage their inventory of maintenance supplies. Most uh-huh. most of them, you know, they didn't realize they could use Granger as a just in time warehouse for what they needed. Instead, what people did is. Let's say, for example, there was a light on your elevator that went out, right? You searched all of your 
facilities, couldn't find one, or if you found one, it was broken. So what do you do? You overorder that part because you don't want to be caught again. And what happens is that stuff ages and it gets broken and it gets lost. Instead, our value prop was, well, when your light bulb goes out, just call us. We'll send it over. You don't even have to, we'll, we'll keep your inventory for you. Uh, and that was one of the big, big selling points when I was there 13 years ago was, is, uh, you know, don't buy so much because we have it. It's a little bit what Amazon does today, right? Well, you don't, you don't have to buy 10 things and inventory them. You just need it. And Amazon brings it the next day. We were actually, we actually kind of pioneered that at, at Granger. That's really cool. Um, so you mentioned there's a marketing hierarchy. I never knew. Uh, wh where is high tech marketing in the hierarchy? Well, I would say <laughs> it's probably, I'd say it's in the bottom quartile. I hate to say oh, no. it, but yeah. Yeah. Cause it's services, right? It's, uh, a lot of the tech clients that we work with are very proficient at technology as you would expect. But when yeah. we try to get them like their go-to-market proposition or, or their, their brand positioning, we have a whole division at Gartner that's focused on helping tech companies tell their story. I mean, they have a great technology. There's no question about that, but sometimes they don't know how to tell that story. And that's where we help uh, it, in, in many ways. Um, so that, that's been, uh, I have a number of friends that work in that division. They do a tremendous job. Uh, you know, for example, one of the things that we talk about is that people that buy large technology purchases have almost instant purchase regret after they sign the contract because they feel like they don't have all the information they were forced into decision or, or they just had to get something done. So it's, it's our understanding of tech buying is actually quite extensive and that actually helps us help them market to the buyers because we can see it from both sides. It's a very interesting approach that we've taken over the years. I need to tap into that. We're a client, so I should, yeah. uh, I should, use, <laughs> should use this. Yeah, um, definitely. Very good. So how did you get from there to Gartner? So I got caught up in some politics, unfortunately, at Granger, as we all tend to. I was a vice president at the time, and it happens, and I don't take it personally at all. Um, I actually got... Uh, laid off during the 2010 recession. Mm -hmm. My wife says, can you please not get laid off during a recession? So, um, you know, so obviously if we're, if we're facing one right now, I'm, I'm getting a little nervous, but I think I'm in a much better position at Gartner than I was at my previous company. I think so. I'm sure the book helps. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. It helps. So basically again, you know, 2010 are, you know, we're still in recession. I'm a vice president. I make a decent amount of money. Um, you know, I am trying to get a job, you know, it's, it's, uh, so I, I do the networking, uh, you had a good, I had a good eight, nine month runway. So I wasn't, it wasn't urgent. And, uh, so I basically, you know, network with hundreds of people. And one of the people I contacted was my old friend at Quaker, who I used to work with Steve Smith and he was at Gartner as well as our other colleague, Dale Hagemeyer. And I said, Hey, I'm just networking. Um, you know, here's where, here's my situation. You know, I'd love to connect. I wasn't expecting any type of job and stuff. And then, you know, a couple of weeks after I, I talked to them, they said, Hey, we've got a job for you. Now I was an executive outplacement and I was, my career tra trajectory was chief marketing officer. Cause that's what I, I've been training for my entire career, almost 22 years of training. But then, you know, Gartner comes in and said, we have a job and we think you'd be really good at it. And I didn't really take it seriously at first um, because I was so, I was ego driven, right? My ego said chief marketing officer, chief marketing officer. But then I did the numbers and I said, well, you know, I, at the time I was 45. And uh, as you know, that the tenure of chief marketing officers, they're like fireflies, they're like one year, two year, three years. So I just did the math in my head and it, very soon I was going to be in my fifties and be out of work. And I'm like, do I want to take those chances? And part of me said yes, part of me said no. But as I interviewed with Gartner and learned about what an analyst did and how my skills could be transferred, I became more and more curious. And the other, the odd thing, Steve, is when I would tell my friends um, that I was interviewing and what I was going through, their immediate response without hesitation is, oh, I could see you doing that. And, and then my executive coach told me, I think you need to take this seriously. And my wife said, I think you need to take this seriously because other people around me were seeing something that I did not, yeah. which was they thought I would be very happy at Gartner and it's better. It was a better fit for me. So I took a leap of faith. I listened to, you know, my coach and my wife and my friends and yeah, I, you know, 
luckily I made it through the interview process at Gartner, which is pretty extensive. And, and here I am. So it's 13 years later. It's been a great ride. That's amazing. So, um, is this the first book that you've written? This is the first book. Yeah. So, um, uh, first book for me, third book for my, my co-author and dear friend, Mark Reschino, who's based in London. Uh, so yeah, he actually taught me a lot about how to structure a book, how to do the interviews, how to write. His writing a book is different than the normal writing we do at Gartner for our research notes. So it was a slightly different style and huh. it was, um, it was kind of liberating, Steve. Uh, Gartner has a very, as you know, Gartner has a very specific style of writing. Uh, but the book gave us an opportunity to be much more conversational, which I hope you're, you know, you're, you've, you've seen so far in, in our yeah, approach because this is a, it's a great yeah, read. Yeah. It's, oh. it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so that's the difference then, uh, more conversational. Are there any, any other, as a writer myself and I'm like a geeky yeah. writer, so I, it's, uh, Unix device drivers and yeah. uh, Bluetooth beacons. But, you know, <laughs> I really try and bring some humanity to to those subjects. The first time, we, we really didn't. But the, the, the second time, I, I feel pretty good about it. But what what were the other, were there any other differences in your, from your Gartner writing style and your book writing style? I would say that we use more metaphors, more commercial metaphors. So I'm a big Star Trek fan. Mark is a Star Wars fan, a big music guy. So we use some of our own personal interests uh, in in the story. One of the things we talk about in the book is we hate uh, dr drudgery, household chores. Mm -hmm. I hate doing laundry. Mark hates mowing the lawn. So we, we peppered throughout the book, you know, little moments of humanity, of, of who we are as authors interspersed with the content some of it very technical some of it very business strategic and some of it just just fun and thought-provoking so that that to me was very liberating for us and uh and we had fun you know we had we had fun with it and we also we also used what i would call what i i was taught as saturday language oh. so too too often we talk in techno babble mba speak you know and yeah. i'm guilty of it you might be guilty of it but the sure. idea of Saturday language is, you know, if I had to tell my neighbor what I was working on and he or she did not know anything about my business or what I did, how, do, how would I explain it to them? So going back to Saturday language, especially for something new like this, was very important to us. And what uh, what was it like having Gartner as, the, are they technically your publisher? Uh, obviously, the, the, yeah. they're your employer, but uh, I, is that kind of, if you're going to write a book and you're an analyst, you're an analyst do that, does Gartner have to publish it or was it a choice for you? So it, uh, Gartner historically has published books. We've published about 15 over the last 20 years. Uh, and traditionally, we work with a publisher. Yeah. Um, this is actually the first time that we did it ourselves. So Gartner is the publisher and we published on the Kindle Direct platform with Amazon which is all print on demand. Um, that's why yeah. the book doesn't have a dust cover is because that is actually an example of Amazon's print on demand hardcover, which is a relatively new capability there. They've been doing soft cover for years now, but hardcover was, was relatively new. And you know, we, we saw an opportunity, Steve, to take our own advice. We often tell our clients, try new technologies, try disruptive things, see what happens. And that's what we did. Uh, and so far, so good. You know, we don't get the benefit of a publishing house's marketing department. But, you know, what is marketing today? We we basically, we're all over LinkedIn. We're doing stuff like this. And Mark and I are going to be at 10 different conferences this year, maybe more, to do book signings. And, you know, a lot of this is for our client base. So we're, we actually, Gartner has 12,000 uh, relationships. We have relationships with 12,000 different organizations around the world, tens of thousands of people, those are the people we want to connect with and, and right. how we want to add value and, and demonstrate thought leadership. So it's a different type of approach, uh, to what we normally used to do, what we have done in the past. Very good. Well, I could go on and really get into the, to, to the whole publishing <laughs> thing, but we'll, we'll spare our audience. Uh, but I do want to ask you our traditional question, which is what three songs have meaning to you? So uh, I, I love this question. Um, the first one is from 1985, which is Simple Minds Alive and Kicking. And at that time, I was a sophomore 
at DePaul University, living away from home for the very first time. And that song just was blaring constantly. So in addition to being a great song, it actually, it was a, it was a reminder to me. And, um, and I still, I still enjoy hearing it. it. It brings back a lot of memories. It's same thing with like, don't you forget about me, the breakfast club, cause I'm a Gen Xer. Uh, uh, yes. it, and, uh, so that, that one was, was a good one for me. And, you know, here I am 57 years old at Gartner alive and kicking. So I, I think it was hopefully a, a prophetic for me. Very good. Great choice. And I actually have, we used to have, uh, the, our editor would, uh, put the song in the background, but for copyright reasons, we yeah, I understand. had stopped understand. doing that, but I do have that song playing in the back of my head. <laughs> good. So, uh, that was a good choice. Very good. So the second one is uh, At Last by Etta James, and that was a song that played at my white, my wedding uh, and the first dance for me and my wife. So I picked the song, and, and, it, and that has a lot of meaning for me. And, uh, cool. you know, that was, uh, and you, you, I'm sure many people know the lyrics. I don't have to repeat it, but it was, it was meaningful. Um, and then my third Excellent. one was, uh, uh, as an introvert, a capital I introvert, I was definitely, definitely afraid of karaoke. I mean, I just refused to do it, refused oh. to do it. So it wasn't until I was with friends in Tokyo yeah. at a karaoke bar with a private room and, and about five beers in me that I actually had the courage to stand up and I, I, I sang Highway to Hell by ACDC. So that was the <laughs> oh first one. God. Yeah. That sounds it, pretty challenging. Uh, it's yeah, like it, was, it, it was really, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. And uh, one of my one of my friends uh, said, yeah, there's always somebody in the group that says, oh, I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to do it. And they end up singing all night. So I actually sang about five or six different songs and uh, surprised myself. So for me, that song is about kind of breaking out and challenging yourself and having the courage to, to do things differently. So that those are my three songs. Very good. Well, Don, this has been fascinating. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining the podcast. Thank you, Steve. I'm so excited to be here and I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks for watching this episode of the Mr. Beacon Ambient IoT podcast here on YouTube. You can listen to this episode on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed it, please like and share this video. And be sure to subscribe for more videos. For more information about Williot, Ambient IoT, and IoT Pixels, head over to williot.com.